Hello and welcome to the program. Now, Nigerians spent Christmas and the New Year period with the awful experience of another fuel scarcity. It was an experience that affected every other aspect of life of the average Nigerian. Suddenly, transport fares across the country jumped up to more than, by more than 7%, I should say. Prices of foodstuff in the festive period also rose, while the effects was felt in almost every sector of the economy. The development is making Nigerians apprehensive of what the nation's economy would look like in 2018. Although the World Bank has predicted a 2.5% uh, GDP growth in the economy, the soaring price of food and services, of course, making many to be skeptical of the forecast. Economists say the outlook for the nation's economy is bright, considering the massive infrastructural projects taking place across the country simultaneously and efforts to develop the non-oil sector of the economy. Now, importation of rice of... Uh, Rice has reportedly gone down uh, drastically by about 90%, and Nigeria is expected to save about $600 million from rice importation this year alone. The Foreign Reserve is also on a stable rise, while efforts have been made by government to get the refineries working for fuel importation to stop totally. The Central Bank of Nigeria says it is working hard to achieve single-digit interest rate in 2018, while the different government policies aiming aimed at blocking loopholes for uh, pilfering government resources is, of course, getting results. But will all of this deliver the goods to Nigerians at the end of the day? Joining me on the program right now to discuss uh, this further is uh, Muda Yusuf, who is the Director General of uh, the Lagos Chamber of Commons, uh, Commerce and Industry now. Uh, Mr. Muda, thank you very much for joining us on the program. First, just give me your own assessment now or, or your own projection now of... Um, uh, 2018. What what kind of year do you foresee economically for Nigeria? Well, uh, from an economic perspective, the year looks uh, very promising. Uh, the outlook is quite positive, based particularly on the macroeconomic fundamentals that we see. Uh, currently. Our foreign reserves is already at uh, over slightly over four forty billion US dollars. Uh, the foreign exchange liquidity has improved uh, very uh, considerably, and this is significant because it means that there is a lot of uh, a much better access to foreign exchange by manufacturers by the service sector operators, by the agricultural sector operators, and generally across the economy. The access to Forex is now much better because across the entire economy, uh, there is always one need or the other for foreign inputs, which requires foreign exchange. Uh, the inflationary situation is also getting slightly better. Inflation is trending downwards, although not remarkably so currently are slightly over uh, 15 percent. Uh, so, and uh, generally the level of confidence in the economy is also improving because all these macroeconomic fundamentals have a way of impacting positively on investors' confidence. So the level of investors' confidence is improving. So from the perspective of the macroeconomic fundamentals, I would say that the outlook is good. But there are also issues, issues of the investment climate, uh, issues of insecurity that is also assuming a very dangerous dimension now, issues of unemployment, issues of welfare, you know, which falls more on the social side of the polity. These are challenges that we also need to grapple with, even as businesses, because it is not enough for the fundamentals to be right. Uh, we also need a complementary uh, business environment in terms of the infrastructure that we need to operate with, in terms of the attitude and disposition of the regulatory agencies, and in terms of what is happening at the ports, and in terms of the bureaucracy, I mean, what is the attitude of bureaucracy to business, and in terms of policies. 
So these are areas I think we need to be looking forward to. L let's to let's talk sure about those challenges further now, as, especially the challenge of unemployment. What, what, what do you think the government should be doing? I mean, uh, even though the government has done quite a number of things, take for instance the NPower uh, uh, project that has employed quite uh, a, a number of people, even though those jobs are not uh, permanent jobs, if you like. And uh, we also know that the best way to create jobs is to empower SMEs. So, uh, but, but what do you think the government should be looking at and concentrating on, you know, to, to, to create jobs and get more Nigerians employed? Well, uh, first of all, as a background, you know that the unemployment rate currently is about 18%. And when you combine the unemployment with underemployment, you are talking about, about 69%. Uh, that is quite huge, and that portends a lot of social and economic implications which are not very positive. As to what the government should do, uh, there are a multi-dimensional approach to this. First is the area of policy. We need to get the right kind of policies that will support investment. Uh, just as you said, it is the investors that will create the jobs that are sustainable. And when I talk about investors, I'm talking about both domestic investors and foreign investors. Uh, domestic, we are looking at the large enterprises, we are looking at the small enterprises, we are looking at the medium-scale enterprises. Across the entire spectrum of businesses, I think we need to create the right kind of policies to support investment. And talking about policies, first we need to look at our interest rate policy. Uh, the cost of fund is not supportive of investment domestically as we speak because cost of fund is well over 25 percent and for SMEs it can be as high as 35 percent. Uh, that is not good enough to stimulate investment. But, but let, let, me, let me quickly ask you this. Can, can I just quickly interject here? I mean how, how do you balance that because of course, you have said the cost of funds not favorable to uh, domestic investment, but we, we know that that is what um, these foreign investors, especially the portfolio investors, want. And um, as a matter of fact, it, it is because of this high interest rate that uh, we've seen some of these portfolio investors actually rush back. So how, how do you deal with that kind of situation? No, you see, when we are seeking to attract investment, we should also be conscious of what kind of investment we are talking about. The investment that will deliver the kind of jobs and the kind of uh, growth and progress that you are talking about here are basically foreign direct investments. Those are the investments and investors that we stay for a long haul. Those are the investments and investors that we create the jobs. Not so much the portfolio investment. Portfolio investment creates a lot of vo volatility in any economy. Once there is a spike of or a signal of something going wrong, you have a flight of uh, portfolio capital. So if anything, I think we have to downplay our quest for portfolio investment and emphasize more on foreign direct investments. This I talking about investing in infrastructure, investing in industries, investing in agro-processing, and so on and so forth. I think that is what we should be looking at. And we need to create the environment for those who want to have the kind of confidence to come and stay in this economy. Uh, the federal government, of course, has reported that there has been a, a reduction now in uh, our import bill, especially in the area of rice importation. That the rice importation import bill has gone down by about 90%. That must be something very significant, don't you think so? No, we have to be careful the kind of statistics and data that we throw around. As we speak, there is still massive smog smuggling of rice. So if you are looking at official data, of course, the smugglers uh, will not go and register their smuggled rice. It will not feature in the data of the customs. But those goods are here. So we need to separate the, the, the data. Official data, of course, because of the high tariff, rice may not be coming in officially. But unofficially, I can tell you quite a significant uh, quantity of rice still coming to this country. So the data must capture both the official and the unofficial imports into this country. If you want to be realistic and if you want to be uh, very practical 
in the way we analyze the economy and we plan for this economy. I tell you there is substantial smuggling of rice. You need to visit the market. I can tell you not less than 50% of the rice we see in the market are small good rice. So we have to take that reality into account as we plan our policies around agriculture and in particular, in particular about around the rice issue. L let us talk about GDP growth. Uh, of course, the World Bank uh, forecasting that uh, uh, we, 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 we're in for some 2.5% uh, GDP growth. Uh, what's your own take on that? Well, I agree with the positive outlook that has been expressed uh, about the GDP growth. Uh, because in this economy, there is a very strong correlation between the performance of our oil sector, particularly oil price and oil output, and GDP growth and our macroeconomic indicators. Uh, for as long as the oil sector remains what is this, for as long as we have the kind of rally we have in oil price, for as long as you have the stability that you have in the Niger Delta as far as oil output is concerned, uh, we expect a very robust kind of growth. In fact, for us in the chamber, we even have a more optimistic uh, growth number of about between 3 to 4 percent. So the fundamentals support that positive expectation about growth. Uh, let's also talk about um, the Foreign Reserve now and, uh, you know, uh, look at that in relation to uh, the... the the exchange rate in the country today. We, we, gradually, we are seeing rates converge. Uh, now, the CBN has got uh, a, a war chest of around, uh, as you said earlier, uh, slightly over $40 billion, uh, and it's, it's still going up and because we can see the price of oil going up. And uh, uh, I mean, there, there, there are suggestions that uh, we might be hitting uh, b between 45 to $50 billion, probably in the next six months. Now, you look at this huge war chest that the CBN has got. Uh, do, do you think at some point in time uh, that the CBN might uh, decide to uh, think again about its uh, FX policy in terms of uh, its flexibility now? Or you, you expect, or you expect that uh, with this huge watch as the CBN will continue to intervene in, in the forex market? Yes, I think the robustness of the foreign reserves will definitely shape the uh, disposition of the. Uh, central bank, particularly with respect to the foreign exchange policy. As the reserves increase, I think the CBN will, more, will be more comfortable uh, to adopt a, an, an exchange rate that is a bit more flexible, uh, that will also adopt an exchange rate that will also create a, the room for a better uh, role of the market. And we expect to see increased convergence as, uh, as, as we go forward. But having said that, it is important to stress that as the results go up, we need to be also be very careful. What we, be, what we need to be doing at this time is to see how we can take advantage of this windfall to invest in our infrastructure and possibly to even slow down on our borrowing because the burden of borrowing is becoming unbearable as we progress. And as uh, we begin to, I mean, experience very positive performance in the, in, the, in the oil market and with falling reserves, we need to also leave something for posterity. And the thing we can leave for posterity is to invest this windfall, not to just be throwing it into the foreign exchange market so that you have a strong Naira, because we know the harm that a strong Naira has done to this economy. We should be looking more at playing down on our borrowing and investing more in infrastructure. This is what all the key oil producing countries have done. They have used the oil wealth to diversify the economy and particularly to strengthen their infrastructure. I think that is what we should be looking at at this time. I mean, there's, there's no way I can let you go because we have to wrap up, but I have to, let's quickly talk about the uh, 2018 budget. Um, well, quite huge, but uh, when you look at, when you factor in the depreciation of uh, the Naira, not, not so huge as you would expect, but that budget is before the National Assembly. Um, a lot of us had thought we were going to uh, return now, since the president presented the budget earlier, uh, that we're going to return to the January to December uh, uh, budgeting cycle, but it doesn't look that way with what we are seeing because we we still cannot tell for now when the National Assembly would uh, 
would approve that budget. Maybe sometime in February or March. <laughs> you never can tell. It might even get to, to April. But but what do you foresee with the budget? I mean, and what what impact could any delay now have on uh, the government's uh, plan for this year? Well, the delay in the budget and budgetary process is not something that is new. Uh, over the last couple of years, I think we have. We have experienced the budget being passed sometimes in May, sometimes in April, sometimes even close to half of the year. So it's not anything new. But what we desire is what you said initially about returning to the January to December cycle. But from all indications, this is certainly not feasible for the 2018 budget. So we should be looking at somewhere around the, the, the end of the first quarter, maybe in March or late February before we can have the budget. But the implication of that is that this will naturally affect the, the, the implementation of the budget. Uh, traditionally, we have had issues with implementation of the budget, particularly mm -hmm. the capital budget. It will affect the commitment and the capacity of the government to also develop infrastructure. Because you need the budget funds to develop infrastructure. You need to tender, you need to go through all sorts of elaborate processes before contracts can be awarded and executed. So it's going to slow that down. It's also going to affect planning, both on the part of the private sector and on the part of uh, the public sector, because the budget also has a signaling effect as to what direction the government is going, uh, at least on the fiscal front. So these are some of the uh, implications of uh, the delay that uh, we are likely to see with regard to the passage of the budget. Uh, and some of, some of these processes that cause uh, this delay, of course, um, I, I just want you to talk about them very quickly. For instance, we, we know like the Public Procurement Act. Uh, the other day, uh, the Minister of uh, Power, Works and Housing appeared before uh, members of the National Assembly and was actually complaining about the Public Procurement Act, that it takes sometimes between three to four months to, uh, for, for the processes to be completed before you now begin to spend. And the fact is that when you talk about issues like uh, construction of roads in this country, we know the window for construction is very, very limited in this country. Probably you have about six months before the rainy season sets in. Something has to be done about some of these, um, some of these uh, bureaucratic delays. I mean, for instance, like the Public Procurement Act. Don't you think something needs to be done about that? Yes, I think it's part of the reforms that we should be putting forward uh, at the level of the National Assembly and at the level of the executive. Uh, if you are complaining about budget implementation, I think these are part of the reforms that are needed. We need to review the processes and the time frame within which uh, uh, projects can be executed, contracts can be awarded. Even the budget itself, there should be a proper time frame within which the National Assembly should consider the budget and pass it time frame within which the executives should present the budget, time frame within which, after passage, the executives also should ascend to the budget. This, there are some very critical reforms that we need to put in place to ensure that this happens. And even beyond that, we need to deal with the constitutional issue of who has the final say on the budget. We have seen this recalling year in, year out, where the uh, executive will accuse the legislature of adding to the budget, of deleting it, the legislature will argue that by virtue of what the Constitution says, they have the final say on the budget as to the fact that as, as expressed in Section 80 or 81 of the Constitution. So we need to get the judiciary to make a pronouncement on who has the final authority on the budget. It's very important. Let's talk about interest rates. Uh, you've, of course, voiced your own concern. Uh, going forward this year, uh, of course, we can see accretion now to the reserve. Uh, we can see things stabilizing. Uh, uh, very soon, of course, we expect that uh, the Monetary Policy Committee would be meeting. Do you expect to see some kind of easing this time? Well, uh, what I expect uh, is one thing. What is desirable is another. What I expect, perhaps, is that there may not be any significant change. Uh, because uh, given the disposition and the mindset of the Central Bank of Nigeria, uh, with inflation still at above 15%, and with the kind of way the CBN thinks, uh, it is not likely that there may be easing of, 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 of the interest rate or monetary policy regime. 
But as to what is desirable, we think that there is a need to ease the conditions and bring down interest rates. How do you balance that with the fight against inflation? Well, it's a balancing act. But when you are dealing with economic uh, issues, you need to also prioritize. What is the bigger priority? Is it for you to grow the economy and create jobs? Or maintain stability and not have the jobs? So we have to make a choice. Normally, if you are growing an economy, if, you are, if the economy is active, naturally there will be some element of inflation worldwide. There's a correlation between growth and inflation. But you cannot say that because you want to maintain inflation, we stagnate the economy. Because the economy needs jobs. We are sitting on a time bomb with an inflation or, I mean, unemployment of over 18%. And underemployment and unemployment put together at about 70%. So the bigger priority now is to stimulate investment and create jobs. And you cannot stimulate investment domestically if your interest rate is as high as what it is today. So we need to prioritize in terms of our policy choices. Uh, because uh, sometimes, I mean, you look at, with inflation at 15.9% uh, 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 currently, of course, I mean, it's been trending downward since uh, February of uh, last year. Um, you expect it to continue to go down? Uh, of, uh, because the, the government, for instance, uh, is targeting 12.4% in this year's, uh, with this year's budget. Now, you, you think that is realistic uh, enough? You, you think uh, inflation could drop to as low as that uh, level? Inflation can drop if we are able to tackle the key drivers of inflation. One of the major drivers of inflation from my own perspective is the cost of operations and cost, cost of production. So we are dealing with a major issue regarding cost. It's not even so much a monetary phenomenon as the CBN uh, will, will naturally want to, want to say it. It's more of a cost push inflation. So we should be looking at things like the energy cost, for instance. For instance, for manufacturers, the cost of gas is priced in dollars for manufacturers at $8 per, per SCF per, per SCOF which is far higher than what obtains in many other parts of the, of the world. Many other parts of the world are about $2 or even less. So if you are charging the manufacturers and those who are producing at $8 per, per SCF, and they produce and they are selling in Naira, why will their cost of production not go up? Why will the price of their products not be high? So the cost of production, the cost of logistics, cost of energy, these are the things that you, be, you need to be looking even cost of funds. We just talked about interest rate. If you are paying a very high interest rate as somebody who is in production, it will affect your price. So we need to address the issue of boosting output. All the factors that boost output, if you are able to tackle them, inflation will come down. Uh, I, I, I have to quickly ask you this finally, even though I keep, I keep saying finally, but, but, but finally, um, Go, going forward, going forward, what, what do you expect to see? Well, what I expect to see uh, first is for the government to support investment and investors across all levels of business. Micro enterprises, small businesses, medium enterprises, and large enterprises. There has to be a more constructive engagement. A bit of that is going on already, but we need to be more active in engagement at sectoral levels so that we know what the challenges to investment are at each of the sectors. So the ministry should engage at sectoral level so that we can knock down the barriers impeding investment. Because the way to go is to stimulate investment, is to encourage those who are already investing, is to encourage new businesses. So we need to look at the totality of our policies, the totality of our uh, investment environment, and support investors to, 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 to grow. I mean, look at the oil and gas sector, for instance. There are major policy problems and governance problems in the upstream of the oil and gas in industry, in the midstream, which is refineries and, uh, and uh, fertilizer and petrochemicals, and in the downstream, which is marketing, pipelines, and the rest of it. We have major policy problems there, which is making it difficult to unlock 
the huge investments that we need to power this economy. So these are some of the things that we need to do to move the economy forward. Mm. All right, Mr. Muda Yusuf, thank you very much for talking to us on the program, and thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. All right, we'll take a short break now, and when we come back, uh, we'll continue the program. On Deji360, we don't just ask the questions. What is wrong with amending the Constitution the way uh, the, the National Assembly members have been doing it? We seek answers. The Constitution is constituent. Our problem is not um, lack of laws. Our problem is lack of the willpower to implement our laws. Answers that provide clarity. While we negotiate, we should try to make it a point that the girls must be complete. The clarity you need to make informed judgment so that you can make the right decision and take action. People are saying it is you politicians that are responsible for this, that you are the reason why oh, this is happening. All these dollars that call themselves governors in this country? I wish we had people like Tony at the National Assembly. God forbid that I go to join that uh, DG 360, providing clarity to issues.